Hello, everyone, and welcome to our joint webinar hosted by P. Cloudy and Test House. We're thrilled to have you with us today for an exciting session on uh, revolutionizing uh, digital testing using test automation. So before we dive in, let's cover some housekeeping rules. Your lines are currently muted, but feel free to submit your questions during the webinar using the chat option that you see at the bottom of your screen, and we'll address them in the Q&A section at the end. And also note that this webinar is being recorded and we'll send out the link later so that you can share it with your friends or colleagues. So now let's get to know the two awesome organizations behind this webinar. So first up is PCloudy. PCloudy is a cloud-based testing platform offering 5,000 plus real devices and browser combinations for mobile and web app testing. Key features of PCloudy include continuous testing, DevOps, advanced automation, AI-based visual testing, robotic process automation, real-time test analytics, and more. With integration with popular testing frameworks and tools and round-the-clock premium support, PCloudy is trusted by 300K plus registered users from small businesses to large enterprises. Uh, next slide, please. Next, meet Test House, a 23-year-old global software testing and quality engineering company based out of London, UK. With a mission to contribute to a world of high-quality software, Test House has helped businesses deliver exceptional user experiences through innovative uh, quality engineering or quality assurance solutions. They focus on enabling total quality management for technology-driven businesses. It's all about harnessing change and innovation to benefit customers. Next slide, please. Uh, so PCloudy and Test House have joined forces in a strategic partnership to revolutionize digital testing and quality assurance. This partnership combines PCloudy's advanced cloud-based testing platform with Test House extensive experience in software testing and quality engineering. Together, we are better positioned to provide a seamless testing experience for businesses. A key aspect of this partnership is uh, mutual expansion into new markets with Test House strong presence in the Middle East, the UK, US, and Australia uh, helps PCloudy solidify its global reach. This is the beginning of an amazing partnership and we aim to help more businesses deliver unparalleled value to their customers around the world. So now that you know a bit about uh, both PCloudy and Test House, let's move on to the actual main event. We are honored to have George Ukru Chief Solutions Officer at Test House as our speaker for the day. George has more than two decades of quality engineering experience uh, and has worked with numerous Fortune 500 clients in implementing agile testing practices. He's also carried out more than three dozen maturity assessments using digitized frameworks and value stream map to define roadmaps and strategies for agile, DevOps, and cloud transformation. Some of the use cases is implemented include automated user story reviews, self-healing automation engines, and bot-enabled data provisioning. With his wealth of knowledge and expertise, we are confident that this session will be both informative and inspiring. So without any further ado, let me hand it over to the speaker for today, George Ukuru. Thank you, Zorulin. Hope you're able to hear me loud and clear. Yes, George. Yeah. Okay. So today's topic is around uh, digital testing, especially uh, with the focus around uh, test automation. So what you're going to do today is you're actually going to take a look at uh, how digital testing is different. You're also going to take a look at some of the challenges that you may be facing on a day-to-day -day basis while testing digital apps. You'll also be taking a look at uh, around 10 different focus areas or maybe a checklist with around 10 different items, which will actually help you to improve the way you deliver experience, a digital experience to your customers. So that is what the agenda is. So let's move on uh, to look at the focus area around digital. So a simple definition of a digital app is it can be any software uh, that can be run on a laptop or that can be accessed by a laptop or a desktop or even a smartphone or even can be a kiosk. Can be actually called as a digital app and you should you and, and the intention of building that app would have been to actually deliver information or content or it can be to sell a product or it can be maybe in order to deliver a service. So this can be maybe a very simple definition of a digital app. And folks who have been in testing uh, for the last 10 or 15 years, they would have got an opportunity to actually at least interact or at least work in an application where there is non-digital kind of application. It can be a desktop-based application or even mainframes or AS-bonded kind of uh, software. So you might be knowing that the, the way you actually test a digital app is very different 
from how you would, you would have tested a desktop based app or a mainframe kind of an app. So let's look at how the, what the difference is. For example, most of these digital apps that you see, whether it's an e-commerce website or a, maybe a content media website, it, everything is actually revolving around the needs for the business. So you basically have a lot of competition and the needs of the business would actually change every day. So it's very important uh, for product teams or maybe for application teams to deliver applications faster to production. So you'll have to quickly adapt to change and you may very, you may get very limited time to test some of your, uh, or many, many of your digital apps. It's also important to provide a very good experience as well as uh, personalized as well as effortless experience to your customers. Personalization can be in terms of showing up products that the customer has bought in the past, or it can be in terms of maybe showing content that uh, the, the user prefers to read, anything of that sort, which is very personalized based on a user's shopping pattern or usage uh, patterns. Or at the same time, you should also be making sure that the, the, the user or the actual consumer is able to complete a customer journey or a business process without having any kind of trouble. And now, since you actually have various channels uh, maybe for accessing information or let's take an example of maybe a website like amazon.com you have a responsive website as well as a mobile app you can actually search for an item add it to your cart and maybe complete the purchase on a mobile device and you should be actually delivering the same kind of experience the user should not feel a lot of difference between the responsive website and the mobile app so providing omnichannel experience is also another important focus area since all of these digital apps are exposed to the internet there are the high chance that uh, hackers can actually maybe uh, look at uh, attempting to actually hack into your system so protecting your app as well as data is also very important when it comes to digital apps all of these apps can be actually used by maybe thousands of users or even millions of users and your entire business maybe maybe if you're a digital first kind of a company majority of your revenue would be actually coming in from your digital what you call software so it's very important to actually ensure that your, your applications are scalable as well as reliable Brand is another important aspect. You should be able to ma maintain a consistent brand identity across all your channels. And also you should be actually looking at aspects like digital inclusiveness, especially when you're actually trying to sell uh, products or provide services to uh, customers. None of the digital products that we see today did not actually have a rating of five out of five when we started off or when they started off. So it is the, the, the experience and the quality was actually bought in over a period of time. So it's very important to actually understand that fact and then look at continuously improve your experience as well as the quality of your apps by actually looking at uh, the usage pattern as well as the behavior pattern of your customers. So these are maybe a couple of ways in which the digital testing is different. But when you actually look at ways of implementing this, if you are trying to actually test a digital app, you may actually come across many issues. You may not have enough, what do you say, you may not have the right set of tools, uh, what do you say, in your, uh, 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 with you to actually do the testing. You may not, you may be actually having very low levels of automation due to which uh, you may not be able to deliver applications faster to market. You may be actually providing, what do you say, you may not be actually using metrics or maybe leveraging dashboards or insights to actually improve the way testing is done or you may not be actually you may be you may not be testing your workflows enough and you may be actually leaking in defects to your production as well as you may be actually delivering a very poor customer experience many cases you may not have enough focus on non-functional testing including performance and security that actually leads to security breaches or data breaches or it can be actually slowness that the customers may experience when uh, they are actually using your app in production so there are multiple challenges you may you might have faced all of these challenges or at least some of these challenges when you're actually testing uh, digital apps uh, during your uh, what do you call uh, projects and if you look at uh, maybe a couple of areas there are there are 10 items that i'm actually going to cover as part of the webinar today so we're probably looking at 10 different areas that uh, or 10 different focus items uh, which can actually help you to improve the quality as well as the experience that uh, uh, you're delivering to your customers and you can actually call it as a 10 point framework that you can actually use in order to streamline your testing so you're actually going to take a look at the way uh, better ways of doing maybe test design you're actually going to look at the ways the different ways of uh, what do you call uh, uh, carrying out test automation you're going to look at how to test for user experience you're going to take a look at how is that you can actually do more of uh, security testing as well as performance testing within your sprints you're also going to take a look at how is that you can actually improve the brand visibility as well as look at continuously improving your product by taking feedback from production. So we'll actually go on with the first item, which is basically the model-based testing approach. So we are talking about digital apps. 
So when you actually when you are actually testing a digital app, you are testing the app, and there might be a lot of workflows within the app, and there might be workflows that may actually span across multiple other applications. You may actually have interfacing applications or what you call a satellite applications, which may have inbound or onboard interfaces. So you may need to actually test for all of those uh, workflows when you, if you want to completely test your digital app. So you're not just thing of you're not just just testing maybe an e-commerce app. You may be testing a pricing engine. You may be testing a promotion engine. You may be actually uh, testing maybe an account management system. You may be actually testing maybe a customer relationship management system if you have membership and things like that. So it is not just like one system. You may you may be having complex workflows that span across maybe 40 or 50 different applications. And I've seen workflows which may actually go all the way to maybe 250 steps. So if you want to actually properly test those workflows, and these workflows are something that can actually get you revenue. It can be a simple example of a, a business process or a workflow can be maybe onboarding a customer to a bank, maybe a digital bank, uh, through, through a website, or maybe uh, checking out an item and paying for it during, uh, in, in an e-commerce website. So all of these are actually tied to your business. It can actually impact your quality of service or revenue if, if the workflows are not proper. And the best approach that we have seen in the past working is to basically use an approach called model-based testing to design test cases. So what you basically do using this approach is basically uh, you actually go ahead and create a flow chart or a business process model diagram that will actually help you to understand the flow of information as well as the different kind of business tools that exist within your business process. And you also know various the various conditions. For example, a business rule can actually have maybe a yes or no condition and you make very well know what happens when the user is actually going ahead with a new option or the yes option. So you can you may actually have a primary flow, you may have secondary flows as well as maybe error handling workflows. And if you actually use, if you visualize these workflows, first of all, you'll be very clear on what you need to test. Second thing is you can actually use these workflows to actually create test cases. There are tools like Broadcom, ARD, as well as Desk Compass that you can actually take the input uh, like a workflow or a VPM and diagram, and it can actually generate you test cases which actually test all the paths within your business process. So you're actually saving, you're actually improving your coverage, you're actually looking at uh, what you say, reducing the effort uh, that is required for designing test cases. And tomorrow if your workflow is changing, you can very well go ahead and recreate your test cases by just updating the workflow. So this approach is very Im impactful if you're dealing with complex workflows, whether it is banking, retail, health insurance, or any other domain. And it actually saves you a lot of time and it actually helps you to generate the most optimal number of test cases that might be required for your project or for your program. The second important approach that or second important aspect that you should be looking at when you are dealing with a digital application is definitely if you want to achieve speed to market, you definitely need to look at automation. The automation can be targeted around APIs. It can be targeted around your workflows or maybe what you call as UI based test automation scripts. It can be maybe testing or complete business processes. It can be any of those. And there are multiple ways of actually doing test automation. And an approach that works for me may not actually work for you. So every organization may be different. There are a lot of parameters that actually calls it that actually maybe impact the way you do actually the way you actually decide upon doing test automation or the approach that you need to select for test automation is governed by a lot of parameters. But let's actually take a look at what are the four options that you have for maybe carrying out test automation of an application. One is basically you can actually go ahead with uh, maybe a scripted approach. You can either go with a tool set which is basically open source like maybe Selenium or Appium, or you can actually go with a UFT or a test complete solution where you may have a little bit of scripting and then decide to automate a UI as well as API test. The second approach is you don't uh, you can actually go with a codeless tool or a scriptless tool maybe like Offkey for example, and you can actually use a tool like Opkey to actually automate your test. You don't have to write any kind of script. It is pretty straightforward. You can actually go ahead and create tests for your package applications or for your digital applications, and then uh, execute it uh, using maybe a vCloud is digital form or a browser form or a device form. The third approach is your organization might have invested in RPA. You may actually decide to use uh, an RPA tool to actually carry out automation. If you're dealing with e-commerce or even maybe hardware devices for automation, you may have to actually even use robotics as well as uh, robots or as well as microcontrollers to actually automate your testing. So the approach that you may actually select or decide upon should be actually on maybe a couple of parameters. So all of these approaches may not be required. You may actually have to maybe stick on to maybe one approach in some cases too, but I think it's very important to decide upon one single approach if you're actually looking at automating your digital application assets. One aspect that you need to definitely look at is basically 
do I have the required skill sets? For example, today if I'm deciding to go go ahead with a scripted approach, do I do I have enough engineers within my organization who can actually do scripting and automate my test? Will they be able to do uh, execution as well as maintain these scripts on an ongoing basis? Is the scripted technology that I'm going to use, is it going to support all my technology needs? I may have maybe desktop-based applications, I may be still using legacy, I may have mobile applications, microservices, and all of those. Will it support all my technologies? Have I already made investments in test automation? And if I'm if I if you have not made investments, is there an appetite to actually invest in tools? Or should I stick on to the open source uh, what you call stack? So there are a lot of parameters that may actually decide the approach that you should be actually picking. Uh, or selecting to actually carry out test automation organization. Don't go with what your friends have done or what your neighbors have done. You should be actually taking a look at your organization and then selecting the right approach. And if you don't select the right approach, you may not actually get the required investments or required returns from the investments that you make from uh, test automation. Now moving on to point number three. So it's very important to actually provide feedback to your development teams. Why? Because in, uh, in today's world, we are actually dealing with sprints there are two weeks or three weeks. You may be actually uh, maybe getting a uh, build maybe in the second day, and you should not be actually doing testing for one and a half weeks and then providing a list of bugs to your developers. It's very important for testers to actually provide feedback on a daily basis. That means you should be actually executing your test on a daily build. You should be actually running both your functional tests as well as non-functional tests. You may not be running maybe 100% of your tests. At least you should be actually sel in selecting a, a subset of your tests and then running it. So that you can actually provide a list of bugs to your development team on a daily basis and then they can start fixing it. If you keep your testing to the last few days of your sprint, there's a good stance that none of your user stories will actually have a done status towards the end of your sprint because they might be open defects because the development team may not be able to fix it a day or two. And if you want to integrate your test with the DevOps pipeline, maybe with a tool like Azure DevOps or with Jenkins or maybe a GitLab uh, uh, kind of uh, what you call DevOps platform, it's very important to actually have a good amount of uh, collaboration with your development infrastructure as well as DevOps team. So you definitely need uh, better collaboration ways of working with these teams if you want to actually implement uh, a DevOps enabled uh, what you call testing or a continuous testing within your organization. But it's very important. There's no point in actually doing what you call test towards the end of your sprint, even if you have, we have seen a lot of organizations who would actually does test Automated test, maybe toward the end of the sprint, does it make sense? You should be definitely using or leveraging the power of DevOps to actually provide feedback to your developers on a regular basis. The other important aspect, uh, especially when you're dealing with browser-based as well as, what you say, uh, mobile apps, uh, which are basically native, is basically to look at uh, compatibility testing. So you may have to run your test maybe across maybe seven different browsers and 30 different devices. And you should definitely look at doing a, a large scale execution in a parallel and distributed mode if you want to actually complete your automation test cycles on time. Otherwise, you may be running your test for days together to complete the validation on all these device and browser combinations. So it's very important to actually use latest technologies. You can actually run your test in cloud or you can actually run a good amount of your test maybe by spinning up Docker instances. So you should be actually leveraging all the latest technologies, especially device forms, browser forms, which are actually public, uh, uh, what do you call, public hosted. For example, pCloud is a good example. Uh, pCloud provides both browser-based forms as well as devices on which you can actually run your test. You can integrate your framework uh, with uh, the pCloud platform and then run your test uh, uh, on that platform. Or if you want to run it maybe uh, on a cloud machine, you can actually have multiple instances being set up and then you can run your test on that. Or you can actually have, have an on-prem infrastructure on which you can actually set up Docker instance and run your test. And, and the other thing is, you should not be running tests in sequential mode. You should be able to run tests in a parallel as well as distributed mode so that you can actually complete your test cycles on time. The next important point is around performance. So when it comes to, uh, what do you say, digital apps, as we are talking about two to three weeks sprint, you cannot actually leave your performance testing towards the end when you're actually having a hardening sprint or a release level sprint. It's very important for you to actually provide feedback what application performance to your developers early in the life cycle. So you can actually start off with smaller tests. You can actually start off with maybe performance testing of your APIs. Maybe you can actually do a feature level test and then pass on that feedback to your developers. It is not server side tests. Server side tests are very important. You need to ensure that your server doesn't give you memory leaks. The CPU utilization is under control. All of those things are actually required. But at the same time, it's also important to focus around client side performance. 
So you should also you should also make sure that your apps are actually downloading or your apps are actually showing up screens maybe in two to three seconds of time. You can actually look at maybe the, the, the information that's coming in. How much time is it taking for the maybe the uh, the, the 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 image with the biggest size or the uh, highest what do you call MB uh, to actually or maybe the image file that is high? Your, how much time is it taking? Is it taking for that image to actually get loaded? So all of those things should be actually considered. One aspect is basically users do not have a lot of patience uh, when they're actually using these kind of uh, digital apps. There's a lot of competition. They have better apps to actually go after. So it's very important to actually look at both server side as well as client side performance. And then as a part of your DevOps pipeline, you should also be integrating your uh, test with your DevOps pipeline. Maybe you can actually run your test. Maybe if your full, full workload is 100 users, at least you can run it with 25 users initially as part of your daily build and then provide the feedback. And maybe towards the end of your release or on a weekly build, you can actually go and run your test maybe with a full load. So it's very important to even pass on feedback to your development team uh, around performance as well. The next important aspect is around security. So if you look at security, the traditional practice of security has been to actually carry out security testing towards the end of the release, where you actually use a commercial tool or an open source tool to run a code scan. You basically do something like a static application security test. And then soon after that, you may actually even do a dynamic application security test or a network penetration test. So all of those things are basically sequential tests that's done towards the end. And many, from my experience, what I've seen is like, you have seen Projects getting delayed because you actually have a number of flaws that are actually detected towards the end of your project, and developers really struggle to fix most of those issues, severity one and two issues, and your project deadline goes for a toss. So the primary issue there is you're actually doing this towards the end. And now we should also look at the team who's actually doing. So you may have a dedicated set of engineers uh, who are part of a maybe a security team who are in, who are actually uh, deploy to actually test your particular app. It may be a shared services team and they may not have enough bandwidth uh, to actually test your apps. So you basically it's wait for their time to actually get the, get their reports. And even after you fix your defect, you may have to work, you may have to wait for days to actually get their time to do a rerun of these tests. So it's a very old method of doing things. And in today's world, as we are talking about uh, uh, the need for quickly adapting uh, towards the, the change from based on the business needs, it's very important to actually carry out everything in a much faster mode. So the first thing, it's very important to actually look at implementing DevSecOps practices and also look at uh, educating your development team around secure coding practices because it takes a lot of time to fix. So preventive actions are much better than corrective actions. So as a preventive measure, basically educate your development team uh, on secure coding practices, give them guidelines so that the code quality is better and you don't actually get a lot of issues when you're actually going ahead and doing a, maybe a code level scan. The second important aspect is it requires a mind shift change. Every organization is used to having a security team. And now when you actually move towards a model where everyone is responsible for security, or if you're actually going into the DevSecOps kind of a model, it becomes very important uh, that everyone contributes towards it. There should be contribution from the development team. There should be help that needs to be taken from your security team. You may also have to work with your DevOps team to actually integrate your pipeline. So it requires a complete cultural shift as well as mind shift, uh, mindset shift if you want to actually implement uh, DevSecOps practices. And you can actually implement uh, maybe a pipeline with various different types of scans or various types of scans. It can be basically to look at maybe something like a, a, a composition analysis uh, or software composition analysis is basically done to see the dependency on third party libraries. I think most of you have heard about the recent uh, uh, bug that came in chat GPT, which is primarily due to a third a library having an issue. So if we are actually using third party library, you may also have a risk of actually exposing information because of an issue that is actually there in that library. So it's very important to understand the libraries that you're using and then do a software composition analysis. Developers may actually keep maybe information about authentication, license keys, or passwords within the code, within the file. So it's important to do security scanning or secret scanning. You may also have to look at the code quality and then find out security flaws. You may have to do static application security testing. You may have to actually do dynamic tests in order to find out whether your application is prone to maybe cross-site scripting as well as SQL injection. So it's possible to integrate all your all of your all of these scans uh, to your DevOps pipeline and then look at maybe doing it uh, maybe hands-free. So if, if once your development developer checks in the code, your DevOps pipeline will get triggered and it actually scan all of these things and actually give you a report telling that there are X number of issues being reported uh, across these various phases of your pipeline or various stages of your pipeline. It's very effective. 
uh, it may take some time for you to implement it initially but once it is implemented for a, for a program or for a project you can actually use it for a prolonged time it's very important to actually look at user experience and user experience is not again something that you should be actually doing or looking at when you're actually nearing your release or towards the end of the release you'll actually think about having uh, what you call a user experience just being done now user experience or testers are actually responsible or testers should, who are actually part of a program or a part of an application development group would actually get engaged with user experience right from the beginning of the project so you may be you may actually get an opportunity even to work with ux researchers the ux researchers may actually be talking to your customers they may be forming customer groups but they're actually part of those discussions one of i've seen a lot of inputs coming in from those meetings that the ux researchers might have with your business team or with your real users you may really you may actually understand what the pain points of your users are you may understand what they're looking for you may actually understand the different personas that may be using your product you will be actually understanding uh, what kind of solutions that they are looking at and all of these inputs can be actually taken to write your test scenarios as well as test cases it's also important to actually test or get feedback about your application by actually using maybe low fidelity or high fidelity kind of prototypes so there are various techniques that can be used even testers can actually take these prototypes and then show it to users and get feedback you can also do something like click tree testing uh, creating heat maps and all of those things to actually see what the users would be actually doing when they actually see the screen so you can actually find out where the user might click or the areas where the user might be actually moving their mouse or you can actually see card sorting or techniques like cards for sorting to understand how the user would actually access a particular workflow how, do, how they actually complete a task and what are the steps that they might take based on card sorting so there are various ways in which you can actually get the feedback from the user you don't have to report everything as a bug towards the end you can get this feedback and then use this feedback to actually improve your product right from the beginning so you should be actually applying a ship club principle here as well to actually provide feedback to your uh, what do you say uh, to your uh, development team as well as to your ux engineers on the product and once your product is ready you can definitely uh, we call test do one level of testing but it's also important to actually make sure that you actually get a third party of feeling or maybe talk to a set of people who are very much who are not actually part of your program or product and then get feedback. Crowdsource testing is a very good technique for it. You can actually get feedback from a large set of uh, what you call audience, and you may actually get a lot of issues related to compatibility, usability, and UX uh, by actually doing crowdsource testing. It's very effective. You can actually get the results in a couple of days' time. Uh, you may actually get uh, maybe a bunch of issues even before your product is actually from the from your maybe uh, from your prospects even if your product is actually before your product is even shipped to them. So crowdsource testing is another technique. So all of these techniques will definitely help you to improve the overall experience that you're actually delivering to your customers. The other important aspect. So this is one aspect uh, uh, which often gets forgotten. So there, is, there are a set of people uh, who actually have some kind of uh, what you call disability. It can be uh, uh, disability in terms of uh, maybe color blindness. It can be motion or physical kind of disability. And when you're developing a digital app, whether it is a website or if you're actually dealing with uh, something like uh, even uh, a native app it is very important for you to actually make sure that these apps are actually accessible for everyone so it's very important to actually include everyone whether whether you are having an able person or a, or a different able person it's very important for you to actually look at providing or giving uh, what you call making your app digitally inclusive why because one maybe if you actually have six people one of them can be one out of six can be a, a, a different label person and you actually have 1.3 billion people in today's world uh, who are actually having some form of disability so it's very important uh, to actually provide what do you say access to the to the to the folks who are differently able as well so if you have, when you're designing an app you should make sure that it actually works for them as well because you're actually going to get, they may not be able to access your service they may not be able to buy your products or they may not be able to access your content if you're not actually making it accessibility friendly or digital uh, uh, digitally inclusive so how do we actually enable it so there are various standards against which you can actually do testing so there are i would say like uh, wcag 2.1 web content accessibility guideline 2.1 is one of the popular standards against which you can actually test your app so there are 13 different guidelines and i think around 78 different success criteria that are available as part of 2.1 you have to initially decide what is that you're going to satisfy. So these 78 success criteria can be broken down into maybe 
the three different conformance levels like A, AA, and AAA. Many of the organizations may decide to actually provide maybe uh, conformance up to AA. So you may have to decide that and then start testing your app maybe during as soon as it is ready for uh, digital uh, inclusiveness as well as or for accessibility. So there are multiple tools. DP is one of the most popular tools. They have a framework called AXE and that we have already integrated with one of our existing frameworks. So you can actually conduct these accessibility tests up front and then give that feedback to your developer that this app is actually having issues. It is not digitally inclusive or it is actually having non-conformance with the WCAG standards. Now, look at this, looking at the 78 criteria that you are having, you, can, you cannot actually do an automated testing. Even if you decide to follow all the, maybe if you want to achieve a conformance level of AAA, it may not be possible for you to actually do a 100% automated test. Uh, some of the some of the criteria would include like for example every image should actually have an alternate text which can be definitely verified using an automated tool but the alternate text whether it is actually matching with what you see on the screen may not be something that uh, you may be able to what do you say uh, judge or you may be able to validate using an automated tool. so you have to go with a semi automated kind of approach maybe 40 percent of the items that are related to wcag can be actually validated uh, using uh, maybe an automated tool, whereas the remaining 60% may require manual verification. So it's very important to keep this in mind. 100% automation may not be uh, possible. And it's also important to actually get feedback from folks who are differently able. You can work with NGOs or you can actually include them uh, as part of your uh, user experience focus groups and then get the feedback on what they feel on your product. Are they able to use it or are they finding some kind of challenges when they're using it? This is very important because you're actually losing on a good amount of your audience or a good amount of your customers because your app is not uh, accessible friendly. Uh, but it doesn't take a lot of time. Again, maybe uh, training a development team on standards might be required, but it doesn't take a lot of time to train and then make your apps uh, digital friendly or uh, what do you say, accessible friendly. The last point that I have is around uh, improving, or uh, maybe second last point that I have is around improving the brand visibility. So it's very important to maintain consistency in your brand, whether you're actually dealing with a mobile app as well as a mobile kiosk or a kiosk or a website. So you need to actually maintain your brand guidelines and all of those things. You should also look at the quality of content that is available in your landing pages, uh, in your blogs, or it can be inside your product pages. So quality of content is very important. You should also make sure that your content is actually accessible. If someone is searching for a product or someone is searching for your service, is it coming up with the first few pages of Google search? It's very important to make sure that the right keywords are being used. So test, there are multiple tools like Ahrefs, Moss, and all of those tools that can actually get you this uh, information. But testers also need to actually focus on these areas. So I've not seen a lot of testers focusing around SEO, but it's very important to make sure that your, the content quality is actually ma maintained. So testers need to spend time on validating the quality of content. The other area where testers need to focus is you should also look at what your competitors are offering. So are the competitors using better keywords? Uh, is the quality of their content better than what we are offering? Are they actually getting a better search ranking than us? So it's very important to compare your website using SEO tools with the competitors and then see how is that you can actually do better. And then testers also can actually contribute towards technical SEO in the sense like if you do technical SEO, you can actually get a better search ranking for your website. This includes maybe creating backlinks. Backlinks are nothing but you're actually referring to your website, maybe from a blog or maybe from an article that you're placed in someone else's website. Or technical SEO can also include broken links. So are your website actually having broken links? So it's testers' responsibility to make sure that, that there are no broken links. So you may have be, you should be able to run a scan and then find out what all pages are not as. Or you should also make sure that whether your pages are getting indexed. So every time you actually update or create new content, it's a testers' responsibility to go and find out whether the content is available or whether the content is actually updated and whether the sitemap is actually updated. So that it actually comes up in the search engine. So it's very important to make sure that your content is what you call searchable and it is available in the top of maybe search uh, results when you're actually doing a search uh, in Google or through a search engine like Bing. And it's very important for testers to contribute towards the SEO activities. You cannot just leave it to your marketing team or your technical team to handle it. You, the testers also need to play a very important role to actually improve the quality of content as well as in actually enabling uh, technical SEO. The last point is around uh, continuous quality. So here, so once you, as I was mentioning earlier, no app will actually get a five out of five rating on day one. So you have to definitely look at improving your app over a period of time. So there are various ways in which you can actually improve your uh, 
Uh, one is basically looking at what your customers are talking about your product. So this is basically what you call as customer feedback analysis. Customers may be writing maybe good comments as well as nasty comments about your product or service, maybe in an app store or maybe in social media. So you should be actually having a mechanism using which you can actually scan through those comments, analyze it, and then generate meaningful insight. There are tools that actually helps you do that. Tickets or production tickets are also a very good source of information for you to actually understand how your customers, what kind of problems your customers are actually facing. So the, the customer feedback analysis, both from a sentiment as well as from the actual feedback, you may actually get a lot of understanding on the pain points of the customers and where, what is going well and what is not going well with your product or service. And you should be actually using that feedback to improve your overall product. Now, the second area where you can actually focus is around to understand how customers are using your product. Uh, for example, I am actually using maybe I'm having a website, so I can actually go and find out whether my customers are actually accessing my website or what percentage of my customers are actually accessing my website maybe from a Chrome browser. So how does it help me tomorrow if I'm actually if I if I if I get to know that 95% of my customers are using Chrome, I would actually put maybe my maximum focus around maybe my testing for my next release against Chrome compared with any other browser because I know that. 95% of my customers are on Chrome, and if I'm actually able to good, good, do a good job around satisfying them, I'm actually in, in, a, in, a, I'll be in a better approach. So there are a lot of insights that you can actually generate using a web analytics tool, maybe a tool like Google Analytics, and this information is going to be very useful for you to actually decide upon the areas that you can test, or maybe the browser or device combination that you should be actually using for your testing. And these two information, uh, or these two inferences that you get both through customer feedback as well as from a usage pattern analysis should be actually used to improve your product. So how do you improve? Next time when I'm actually testing your product, or when I'm actually testing uh, my release, I should be actually having a test strategy that accommodates the inputs that I've got from both the customers as well as from these analytics that I've been able to derive from my website or from my digital app. So this is again one more way of improving a product. So basically a way of continuously improving monitoring the quality as well as taking that feedback and improving your overall product. So this, these are maybe the 10 different items, or 10 different maybe focus areas that can definitely help you to test your applications faster. You can definitely provide a better user experience. You can even cut down on your cost because you're actually finding defects early in the life cycle. So it definitely requires all of you to at least implement some of these practices in your project and then also inform me on the results that you see. So now the floor is actually open for questions. Uh, I see a few questions for you, George. Uh, here's yep. one. So what are some of the limitations of using Dockers for cross-browser testing? Okay, so basically uh, Dockers are good, uh, but if you're actually trying to test on maybe maybe 10 or 15 different versions of a browser, for example, you want to test on maybe five different versions of Firefox and maybe like uh, six different versions of maybe Safari. So you need to actually set up that infrastructure with all these versions. So it might be a bit uh, tough uh, to actually set up the infrastructure as well as maintain it. And tomorrow when you're actually having a new version of your browser, you may need to actually have a Docker instance that actually uh, uh, that should be actually set up and uh, that should be actually used to actually validate your product but if you're actually having maybe only a couple of browsers dockers would actually work well and now if you want to test the actual performance of your application on the browser or if you're actually looking at client side performance uh, testing browsers may not be a good option because you may not get the real experience on a docker instance compared with uh, how it would actually behave on a real browser uh, which is actually installed on a laptop or on a desktop. So performance testing wise also, you may actually face a bit of challenges, but if you're actually doing small scale testing, maybe it's a couple of browsers, maybe Docker is a good option. So these are the two important, these are the two areas that where I can actually find maybe a couple of challenges when it comes to Docker. Uh, here's one more question for you. So what are some of the usage analytics metrics that a tester should be analyzing? Okay, so there are various metrics. Uh, for example, if you are actually looking at uh, uh, maybe uh, Google Analytics, or if you are actually looking at a web server log, there's wealth of information that you can actually get from it. For example, you can actually find out how much of your customers are actually returning. For example, if I have, if I have 50 customers accessing my website today, are they actually coming back to my website? Which actually shows that something, some some problem. People are not happy with their website. That's the reason why they're not returning. The other important information that you can actually find out is 
are users having what kind of browsers are my users uh, what do you call using when uh, uh, they're accessing my website what kind of screen resolutions do they have from where are they accessing the website from which part of the world are they accessing it what pages of my applications are actually uh, uh, being accessed and if you're actually having some kind of custom code or scripts written you can even find out the workflows that are used by the most by your uh, what do you call by your uh, end customers so there are there are and then maybe you can also look at screen resolution so especially maybe uh, uh, from this information you can definitely look at what the focus areas for your testing in terms of deciding upon what screen resolutions are my customers using what pages are being used the most where are customers dropping out which pages from which all pages are the customers dropping out this shows that there's a problem with that page and you need to actually do additional testing or you should give that feedback to your developers you can decide upon the mobile devices that your customers are using as well as the os spread so are my users accessing my app maybe from ios alone or maybe there's a good amount of users who are actually using maybe android uh, for accessing my app. So all of the information can be used and you can really optimize your testing. So you don't have to spend a lot of test time testing your apps on every browser and every device. Rather, what you can do is you can actually confine your efforts to maybe the most important things and then maybe go with the risk-based approach. But the difference that you see in this risk-based approach is you're actually using scientific data as well as the usage data and then deciding upon a strategy rather than making assumptions. So that, that, that is what I would actually Say. I think it has been, I, I found it very, very useful in terms of, uh, what do you say, improving your product as well as on cutting down on the efforts that you, actually, that you might be spending on testing. Uh, here's one more question for you, George. So what yep. role do do you think uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning play in digital testing and automation? And uh, how do you think uh, organizations can leverage these technologies to uh, improve their testing process in uh, general? Okay. So when it comes to digital, uh, you can actually look at uh, using AI in multiple ways. Uh, so maybe if you look at uh, maybe something like uh, the same topic that we discussed uh, usage feedback analysis or the customer feedback analysis you can actually use ai to actually analyze or nlp to analyze the customer feedback then understand or generate insights uh, from the customer feedback that has been actually provided by your customers it can be a set of comments that they've written in app store or it can be a set of comments that they've actually written inside maybe a social media forum like twitter or facebook that's one the second area where you can actually do better is maybe look at uh, technologies like uh, self-healing, uh, for example. Uh, if you're actually looking at uh, reducing, if you're actually having changes to your app very frequently, there's a good chance that your application, your automation skills might fail when you're trying to run it across uh, your regression cycle. So what you can actually do is basically, if you're actually trying to use a tool with self-healing kind of capabilities, you can actually use those capabilities in order to reduce the test script failure rates. That's definitely another use case. Now, there are tools that, that you can actually use in order to even generate tests. For example, you're testing APIs or you're actually testing maybe, uh, what do you say, REST-based services. So what you can do is there are tools that can actually look at your API definitions that you might have stored in maybe a tool like Swagger and then auto-generate tests. So there are a lot of tools uh, that are currently available in the market that actually helps you to improve uh, or reduce your test design effort as well as maintenance effort. Now, and also you can also use uh, things like what i was saying like customer sentiment analysis to actually look at improving uh, the way you do testing and then from a user experience standpoint there are multiple tools uh, that we have used in the past that can actually look at the actual emotion of a user when he or she is actually using your app for example it can be basically looking at the facial uh, uh, recognition techniques and then finding out and uh, using emotion detection algorithms to actually find out the actual emotion of a user when he or she is actually using a work. Or there are tools that currently have test analytics capabilities in the market now. What these tools does is, for example, I'm actually having a set of, uh, I would say, like uh, a test case. For example, I'm having 15,000 tests that I should be actually, uh, that I've actually created for my uh, application. So tomorrow, when your developer is actually giving you a build for testing, you really don't know what the developer has actually changed. And you can actually end up running all the 15,000 tests on your uh, digital app, thinking that there might be some impact because the developer has actually done something. Now there are tools 
that actually have capabilities using which you can actually run test based on an analysis, an impact analysis. So what the rule basically does is these analytics based on what they do is they actually look at the, the new version of the app that has been released for testing. And if they basically look at running a scan on that particular app, and then it actually tells you the number of tests that you may need to write newly because there is a new code, new set of code that has been added by your developers, and there are lines of code that have been modified or removed by your developers. So what it tells you is basically you may have to write maybe 50 new tests to actually satis satisfy this portion of code that your developer has written, and then you may need to execute maybe thousand test uh, test cases which are manual or automated from your existing regression pack of 15,000 to validate your app. So you're actually cutting down on your time. At the same time, you're not actually taking a risk. What you're doing is you're basically using this data in order to, what do you call, improve or in order to optimize your testing. So you're using an impact analysis tool as well as test and uh, impact analysis capabilities as well as test analytics to actually derive or identify the focus areas for your testing. And you can actually cut down on the number of tests that you're running by actually using these techniques. So AI can definitely improve improve the productivity of test design and maintenance. It can also help you to improve the quality of your product. It can help you to improve user experience. It can also improve you to cut down on your cost of testing by actually following, by using techniques like impact analysis and test analytics. So there are various use cases, but AI has not reached a stage where you can replace testers. Maybe we'll have to wait for another maybe half a decade or so to get to that level where test AI can actually take over testing. Maybe something like a chat GPT for testing, maybe something of that sort may come in, maybe in a decade or maybe half a decade. So, but we are not there yet. But AI can we should definitely explore the possibilities of using AI and it can actually do wonders, whether you're actually testing a digit lab or a non-digit lab. Okay. Uh, this one more question, Judge, uh, uh, from Nagaraja. So he's asked you to share some test strategy for microservices. So I think uh, most of the testing that you do, I think uh, other than contract testing, so you definitely be doing contract testing if you're actually dealing with microservices. In some cases, the contract testing is actually done by your developers. But if you are not, if your developers are not doing contract-based testing, you should be definitely using tools like PACT to actually do contract level testing and then you can actually or if your developers are doing maybe contract level tests you can actually use maybe uh, what do you say rest assured kind of tools to test the api portion so you should be definitely testing your apis with multiple data inputs to make sure that it actually serves the purpose and that's very important so contract based testing and is the, the, the special thing the special type of testing that you may do on a microservice to actually make sure that they can they are actually having what you call the required capabilities as well as it can it can be actually integrated with the rest of the services and and i think otherwise it's mostly the rest based testing that you do or the study that you may actually be adopting for testing apis can be adopted for microservices as well and there are a couple of other types of testing like contracts that i was mentioning earlier which might be different in terms of microservices there's one more question josh uh, can internal crowdsource testing help in improving the quality of digital applications Okay, so uh, it, it it depends. Uh, for example, when you're actually dealing, if you're actually dealing maybe with an app that is going to be used by employees, assume that you're actually working in a company, in an organization maybe with 10,000 users, and you're actually trying to release an app for maybe for maybe for maybe something like a bot that can actually help you to get your queries answered. Instead of sending a mail to the help desk, rather than that, you're actually going to use a bot, uh, maybe a chat bot that can actually answer queries. So in that case, your organization is only having 10,000 users. It might make sense to actually select maybe a few users from your internal crowd or internal what you call organization and then use them for testing this app that you've built for them. It makes perfect sense. In some cases, uh, if your organization is small and if you're actually maybe, uh, or even if, you, even if you're having a large organization that you're doing, you're working in a services-based organization with 20,000 employees. And if you want to do crowdsource testing of your apps, for your customers, definitely possible. What you can do is you can actually select people who are not working as part of this product, select uh, maybe uh, uh, set up a crowdsource testing platform, and then have testers uh, test these apps and then provide feedback to your product team. But you may have to reward your testers uh, if you don't want to actually, if you want to actually get the required results. So definitely it is possible. I've done that in the past. It is pretty much doable and it gives you very uh, pretty much good results. 
But if we, if we have a program that's very small, maybe you only have maybe a couple of employees, maybe a hundred employee company, you may not get enough participation from your crowd because all of them are busy. Then you, internal crowdsource testing may not uh, actually work. But even if you if you're working in a large organization, if you don't have proper reward mechanism and recognition uh, for testers, crowdsource testing would actually fail, or internal crowdsource testing would actually fail because we don't get enough participation levels and time from your testers. Uh, you're not actually going to get that uh, diversified uh, what you call feedback uh, especially around uh, user experience and compatibility from your users especially when you're doing crowdsource testing but if you're dealing with a mobile app the most important aspect that you would be actually looking to uh, have is to basically look at whether my mobile app can actually work on multiple different devices that if you're not having enough participants you may not be able to get the required results so it's very, it's very important to actually reward your employees. But otherwise, if you, if you want to do a large scale testing, if you want to get feedback maybe from 1,000 users or more, you definitely have to go with external crowdsource testing platforms. But to some extent, the internal crowdsource testing would actually help depending on the app as well as the user base and, and the actual purpose, whether it's validating user experience or maybe validating the, the compatibility, depending on your objective, you can actually expect uh, uh, the results or the required outcomes. Okay, so here's another question. So when it comes to digital lab testing, how do you uh, determine whether to opt for an on-premises solution or a private cloud option? Okay, the very tough, uh, tough uh, question. It's very tough to determine what would actually work. So you have various solutions, right? You can actually go ahead with a physical lab or physical set of devices. Maybe like uh, this used to work well maybe maybe three years before when everyone was actually working in from a single office everyone used to work from office there were no remote working or maybe work from home uh, options available so it might make sense to actually buy maybe a couple of devices and then do testing on those physical devices but in today's world in the last two two to three years one thing that you have seen is like we actually have satellite offices you have good there are there are companies who are completely virtual there are companies where we actually have hybrid modes of working so you may, if you're, if you're testing a mobile app, if you want to test your website on multiple browsers, you may be, you may actually find it difficult to get all the required device models. Or even if you're actually having devices at office, it may not be possible for everyone who's working remotely to actually access these devices. And at the same time, you cannot buy all these devices for each of your employees or engineers. So it's very tough to actually access devices from their home. So maybe a, a, a platform for accessing devices can actually help you there. And now you have two options whether you should actually go with a, a private cloud option, private in the sense like the devices are only accessible for your organization. You may decide to actually set up a platform like vCloudy, uh, which provides you a private cloud option, and then set up maybe 35 or 40 different devices. And only employees who are actually working for your organization, or testers or developers who are part of your organization can actually go and access each of these devices. So it's, it's good, but you may also have to keep in mind that you may need to keep refreshing your devices every now and then, in the sense like, if, you, if there's a new device coming into the market tomorrow, there's iPhone 15, iPhone 16, you may need to actually upgrade your device lab or your private lab with those devices. And many of the cases, there might be, uh, when you set up the lab itself, you may decide upon the, the refresh frequency of the devices. But the advantage that you get there with those options is you can actually get, you, your testers will be able to access these devices 24 by 7, they're dedicated for your staff. And, uh, but you may actually have maybe like only maybe uh, two or three dozen uh, devices available for your need. Now, there's another option which is public cloud, where it might be very cost effective, but you may have maybe like thousands of mobile device models available. And there might be like 10,000 users also who are trying to actually use these thousand device models. So device devices are not guaranteed in the sense like if you want to maybe execute a test case today, maybe at nine o'clock in the evening on maybe iPhone 15 or iPhone 14, the device may be used by someone else. There are maybe like 15 different iPhone uh, devices that are, being, that are there on the platform. All 15 are in use. You may need to wait for those devices to get freed up if you want to actually start your testing. So device availability may not be guaranteed, but you actually have a, maybe a very vast collection of devices, both Android and iOS devices available in the platform. So the, the approach that we have seen working the best is basically a hybrid approach where you do maybe 90% of your testing on a private cloud lab, which is exclusively built for you. And if there are special devices on which you need to run your test, you can actually go ahead and run it on a, maybe a public cloud. So you, may, you can actually go with a hybrid option where you invest in a private cloud, uh, cloud lab for your organization and then 
any devices or any kind of maybe box that you want to retest on a specific device it actually access the public device solution or a public option that's provided by your device provider so this is this is the best option i would actually recommend going ahead with a physical set of devices because it actually has its own problems you will not be able to maintain it you don't have any kind of control and your remote employees or employees working from a different office location may not be able to access these devices uh here's one more question george so what tools would you use for testing chatbot okay so there are there are uh, different solutions even you can actually build uh, uh, what do you say uh, uh, a solution using selenium uh, with a couple of libraries uh, of python you can actually very well uh, use those kind of solutions uh, solutions like ui pods uh, uh, can also help you actually test uh, chatbot but the most important thing that you need to realize when I mean, it comes to uh, chatbot testing us is all about understanding the intent of your uh, what do you say uh, the question that your uh, uh, customer is asking so you need to actually have some kind of intent uh, capability in the sense like you should be able to generate intents to test your chatbots and there are tools that are specifically designed for i think the best tool that i've seen uh, for testing chatbots is a tool called botium uh, which actually helps you to test both the intent the functional aspects the error handling scenarios and all of those aspects so from a chatbot testing standpoint maybe there are a couple of things that you need to keep in mind when you're testing as well as definitely functionality it should actually give you accurate results for whatever you're asking you should be able to handle errors when if you're not able to find an answer for a question you should actually be able to gracefully exit and then tell uh, what you call sorry uh, i'm not able to get this information it should be actually having a personalized what you call should be able to give you a personalized experience it should be actually addressing you by name it should be greeting you the personalization is very important it should be definitely having better responses in the sense like speed is very important uh, when it comes to uh, what you call chatbot so and you should also be able to uh, what you call scale depending on the number of users that might uh, that might be accessing the chatbot but if you want to validate maybe like 80% of these features i would say botium is the best tool but if you want to just validate the intent as well as the functional aspect you can actually develop a custom solution maybe by using python and uh, selenium that can actually help you to validate the behavior all right uh, so looks like we are out of time for today's session uh, thank you so much george for that insightful presentation on uh, revolutionizing digital testing using test automation and for patiently answering uh, the questions from the audience. Uh, so before we say goodbye, remember that uh, we'll send out the recording of this webinar to all the attendees. So feel free to watch it again or uh, share it with your friends and colleagues. And if you have more questions, no worries. You can reach out to us directly uh, through uh, uh, our socials or email IDs and we'll get those questions answered for you. And a, a big thank you to the audience uh, from both P Cloudy and Test House uh, team for joining us today. We really hope you enjoyed uh, today's webinar and learned something new. So stay tuned for future events and uh, collaborations between P Cloudy and Test House. And thanks again for being with us today and have a, an awesome day ahead. We'll see you at our next event. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.